Hi everybody and welcome to Out of the Gate, Daily Racing Forms Weekend Handicapping Preview Program. I'm Dan Ullman. Thanks so much for watching. Here's what's coming up in this week's edition of Out of the Gate. We'll be focusing on Saturday for this week's Out of the Gate. Sunday's Haskell card, the Chouvie at Belmont, the Clemenel, Hirsch at Del Mar. Still waiting for PPs on those. You'll get expanded stakes previews at video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. But it's not like Saturday's chopped liver. Daily Racing Form handicappers Matt Bernier, Mike Beer, and I are going to take a look at the Grade 2 Jim Dandy stakes, the local prep for the Midsummer Derby, the Grade 1 Travers, plus two Grade 1 sprints, the Alfred G. Vanderbilt at Saratoga, and the Bing Crosby Stakes, a Breeders' Cup Challenge Series win in your in. Nicole Russo's pedigree pick focuses on Saratoga race number one for two-year-olds. JK's play of the day, a pick three at Saratoga. David Aragona's Time Form U.S. Spotlight focuses on the Amsterdam Stakes. Plus tournament talks, hot topics, best bets, lots, lots more. So let's break out of the gate. We begin out of the gate with our hot topic segment, the hottest topic in racing, the retirement of Triple Crown winner Justify. On Wednesday, it was officially announced that Justify's racing career is over. The official announcement, filling in an ankle, he'll go to stud in 2019, presumably at Coolmore, pending the final sale. Matt, let's talk about Justify's career. He came out of nowhere, undefeated Triple Crown champion, destroyed the whole myth of the curse of Apollo. Let's start with his Santa Anita Derby. We'll celebrate his career, we'll talk about his accomplishments, and we'll compare him to some other big horses from the past. Yeah, the Santa Anita Derby kind of felt like the, the kickoff, kicking the door down and saying, you know what, I am actually as good as it looks like I was in those first two starts. We can take a look at the stretch run of that race right now. Look, this horse really kind of came out of nowhere. He, he went from zero to 100, and the fact that he showed up and debuted in February, I think that had me and a number of other people a little bit concerned about how much foundation there was. But at the end of the day, Baffert handled him like he was a good thing. I don't know that Baffert thought he would be this good and win the Triple Crown. But at the end of the day, look, this was sort of his coming out party saying, here I am. And this kind of catapulted him to favoritism in the Derby. And Mike, what we saw in the Santa Anita Derby was him taking a test for the first time. Bolt Dioro, one of the top two-year-olds in all of 2017, made a strong run at Justify, and he just really couldn't get within hailing distance when the money was on the line. Of course, Justify then came out to win the Derby. The Preakness was in two weeks. It was a wet racetrack, and he had to deal with good magic, a horse he beat in the Derby, but who a lot of folks thought at a mile and three sixteenths had a big chance to upset him. Yeah, that's that, those things are all true. It was uh, just, it's very interesting just to see the, how quickly this horse um, developed for, for Baffert. And I don't think, I don't think it was like a huge surprise, um, but it, you know, it certainly he had a lot thrown at him in a very short amount of time and he was just up for all of it. He was obviously really impressive when he won that Kentucky Derby on a fast pace the entire way, catching a wet track that day. Um, it didn't seem to bother him. His Preakness where he just emerged out of the fog uh, with the lead in there and then just barely held on. Uh, here's that Preakness. Now you can't really see anything in here, but he, you know, he had to race good magic, a really good horse right from the start in here. And you can see him now, he's getting the advantage. He's gonna hold on late. I think this race sort of made people wonder because it was so close at the end if he was really that much better than these three-year-olds. But I mean, he just came right back into Belmont stakes and he was just much the best in the Belmont, right on the front end in there, never letting that field into the race. He, you know what, he's, he's just a really good horse. It's a shame we're not going to see him anymore. The margin of victory in the Preakness didn't tell the story, Matt, because he did all the running, as Mike alluded to, every step of the way, dueling with good magic over that testing racetrack, finally putting good magic away, and then still having something left to hold off the closers. And now the Belmont, where he went right to the front. A great ride from Mike Smith putting him on the lead and Justify kept finding more. Right at this point, he is extending, making everyone else try to chase and they can't get to him. No, I mean, he's just too much horse for everyone else. And again, it's it felt like this was a pretty decent three-year-old crop and we'll find out if they actually end up being as good as they once looked like they could be. But at this point in the race, there's really nobody else doing any running. Gronkowski from the back, he put in a long sustained bid, but realistically, he was never going to get there to Justify. I guess the big thing for me, I hate to say it, it feels like... Yeah, 
It just feels like he's kind of incomplete. I understand he accomplished something unbelievable, but I have no idea what this horse could have turned into. I would love to have seen him face older horses, and unfortunately, we're just not going to get that. And that's the shame. But as the 13th Triple Crown winner, only the 13th Triple Crown winner in American racing history, you want to compare him with some of the past greats. And I guess the one name that immediately comes to mind is the 12th Triple Crown winner, Bob Baffert's American Pharaoh. It's a hard comparison to make, Mike, because American Pharaoh was a top two-year-old. He would have been favored in the Breeders' Cup Juvenile if he wasn't scratched the day before, leading to one of Matt's great scores with Texas Red. How can we compare these horses? I mean, what Justify did, unprecedented, undefeated three-year-old, never ran at two. How do you compare them with a horse like American Pharaoh? How do you compare the Triple Crown races that they ran? Can you even do so? Yeah, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't really know um, how you can compare them and do it any real justice. I mean, not that I have that much interest in doing it anyway, but, you know, the thing I guess with Justify that I thought was, you know, the most amazing thing is, what did we see this horse for? Was it 100 days, a little bit more than 100 days from start to finish? And that is it, an undefeated triple crown winner. I mean, he accomplished a whole lot in a very short amount of time. And to me personally, and I, I get that others will disagree, but, you know, showing up for two more races, you know, maybe winning them both and maybe winning the Breeders' Cup Classic against, against older horses, I don't know how much more that enhances his reputation if it enhances it at all. Um, I just, I'm happy to call him a really good horse that I saw run and I am prepared to say nothing when inevitably people come to me and say, you know what, he just wasn't that good. Let's talk about horses like a Fleet Alex and Smarty Jones, horses that retired after the Belmont Stakes. Of course, those horses only won two-thirds of the Triple Crown. Very, very talented horses. Their careers were cut short by injury, much like Justify. When you look at Justify's body of work, boy, it, it, it stacks up better, I think, than those two. And those two at the time were considered on the cusp of being super horses, Matt. Yeah, and I think that really the big difference there is like, especially when you compare him to Smarty Jones, he actually accomplished the feat. He won the Triple Crown, he got over the hump. But on the flip side, if you're someone that looks at it from a speed standpoint, at the end of the day, he never ran exceptionally fast. The 107, don't get me wrong, it's not like that was walking in quicksand, but he never ran as fast as Smarty Jones when he won that Preakness with the 118 or 117 buyer. We know Fleet Alex on his best day, he could throw up a big number. And I guess that's the only thing for me. It's not so much that I would have wanted to see him run 15 more times. I just wanted to see if he was capable of throwing up that 120 buyer. We eventually saw American Pharaoh in the Classic. We saw what Arrowgate was capable of as a three-year-old. I think he probably could have done it, but we'll never know. The G word is often thrown around too haphazardly in racing. Great. Would you say, Mike Beer, that Justify goes down as a great, an all-time great? Oh, an all-time great, I, I would have to say no to an all-time great just because he didn't race enough. Um, I think he was a, uh, I'll call him a very, very good three-year-old. Um, you know what, it's a, it's a big problem in the game right now. If you're, if you're really good at three, you don't get a chance to be great because they're not going to let you run past your three-year-old year. Matt, same question. Yeah, I don't know that I would go great. The accomplishment, there's no question about it. It's great, but he did it against essentially just his own age, and he didn't race enough. It's hard for me to sit here and put him in some sort of a top 20 or top 25 category, but at the end of the day, he did something that was unprecedented, so you kind of got you have to give him credit for that. I'll say great accomplishment, great horse, will misjustify. Let's get to some handicapping. The Jim Dandy, the local prep, for the Midsummer Derby, the Traverse Stakes, is your DRF Bet Saturday race of the day. Let's throw up the field for the DRF Bet Saturday race of the day. It is the Jim Dandy Stakes, a grade two, $600,000 is the purse for three-year-olds, perhaps prepping for the Travers later in the Saratoga meet. We're going a mile and an eighth. You can access free formulator pass performances on the race of the day event page at drf.com. You can get expanded stakes analysis of all the graded stakes races on Saturday. And on Sunday, we've got Monmouth, we've got the Chuvy at Belmont, we've got the Clemenel Hirsch at Del Mar, They'll all be up video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. Mike, the number two tenfold. We talked about Justify being a lightly raced horse. They threw a lot at Justify. They've thrown a lot at tenfold in a short amount of time. Yeah, it's not quite uh, uh, Justify-like, uh, if you want to put it that way. But yeah, he's come a long way um, from his debut in February, where he ran a, a very good race first time out around two turns. He's really improved from there. Um, we're going to look at his Preakness run right now where he's not going to be able to quite get there and he can't quite hold second either, 
You're going to see him come running out of the fog here after Justify. Um, he made a run um, around the second turn of this race to get by Bravazzo. Now you're going to see Bravazzo come back and tag him for second. But this horse ran really well in this race, and I liked the race that he ran in the Belmont Stakes as well. He was never going to win that race, but I think he ran um, pretty well and maybe better than it looks on paper. And um, I just love his tactical speed in a race that came up really short here. I think this is a great spot for Temple. Matt Flameaway is such a hard trier, and he put him to sleep earlier this year in the Sam F. Davis on the lead. He draws the inside post. In this short field, he's got to go, right? Yeah, and really for me, it's not so much that I think he's as good as a couple other runners in here. I think Tenfold and Vino Rosso are the most talented horses by far in the race. But I think there's a scenario where down on the inside, Flameaway, you've got one way to go. We're going to go back to his run in the bluegrass. Now, he got beat by a pretty good horse in there called Good Magic. We know what he's capable of. But you'll also see Sporting Chances in here, and Sporting Chances is going to run Saturday as well. For Lucas, I guess the thing for me, and I, there's a real scenario where Flameaway, if no one else wants to go or no one else's intent, we kind of know Flameaway's game. He's going to be forwardly placed. I know he was terrible in the Ohio Derby. Mark Cassie has said he thought he ran a short horse, and if he's not good enough on Saturday, it's plainly because of that. It's not going to be because he's not cranked up and ready to roll. I just wonder, is there a scenario where they look at him and say he's eventually going to come back to us and maybe he gets brave and doesn't stop? If Flameaway gets loose, it obviously helps Flameaway. It also hurts the morning line favorite in my top selection, Todd Pletcher's Vino Rosso, who in all likelihood is going to be last in this five-horse field down the backstretch. What I do think Vino Rosso has going for him is his ability to get this distance. I'm not sure about Flameaway. I am not completely sold on tenfold. I am not completely sold on sporting chance. I know Vino Rosso is a grinding type that will get the distance distance, much as he did in the nine furlong Wood Memorial earlier this year. Let's go back to his Belmont Stakes at a mile and a half, and he was kind of a wise guy horse in this race because folks thought that the mile and a half would be in his wheelhouse. But when Justify spurred it away at the three-eighths pole, it put Vino Rosso on the chase and kind of took him out of his grinding game. He finished evenly. It was a good, solid performance. The feeling has always been for this horse that he'll continue to get better as he develops and matures as a second season three-year-old. I think that Vino Rosso can overcome a moderate pace situation. The price, however, rather unappetizing, but he's my pick in the Jim Dandy. Nicole Russo's pedigree pick segment focuses on perhaps some stars of tomorrow. Two-year-olds in race number one at Saratoga on Saturday. Then you got Peter Thomas Fornatel talking tournaments. Let's hit those segments right now. Hey everyone, Nicole Russo coming to you for Out of the Gate and of course two-year-old racing, a big part of summer at Saratoga and remember throughout this meet, Dan Illman and I are also bringing you Spa Babies presented by Spendthrift Farm here on DRF TV. We take a look at one race per card in that division but Saturday's card at Saratoga does feature a couple of maiden races. So I'm going to take a look at another one of those now for this division because they really are great handicapping puzzles. Taking a look at the field for Saturday's first race for maiden two-year-olds sprinting on the turf, we've got an overflow field, including two also eligibles and two main track only entrants. Certainly going to have a full field no matter how this shakes out. Most of these have not yet started, and I am going to key in on two of the first-time starters in this field. You'll see on this, uh, late, later on in the field toward the outside there, Halliday, who's by Warfront. He is a very good two-year-old sire, particularly in Europe on the turf, and particularly with his sprint runners there. So this race seems like a great opportunity for a son of Warfront. We're crossing two major American sire lines with Halliday, with Warfront crossed over Amer by his commercial rival, Taffet. That one really starting to make headway as a broodmare sire pretty early in the game for him in that category. And this mare, High Tap, was a multiple grade three winner as a three-year-old, taking the Dogwood and the Iowa Oaks. So she really hit her best stride with a little more racing experience. However, she is the dam of three winners from four starters, two of those winners by Warfront, including Tap of War, who was a first out winner in July of her two-year-old season. So this cross seems to work for a precocious runner. Another first-time starter in here is My America by Medallia Doro, who 
we think of as a longer winded type sire, but look at his record with his two year olds. And these are grade one winners alone. We're not even counting horses like Rachel Alexandra, who was a grade two winner as a juvenile before, of course, going on to be a champion at three. My America also from a really classy female family. The dam reaching hasn't produced much yet, but from one of the best female families in the stud book. So you have the hope that they're going to find the right cross for her eventually. She's a hefty European champion, Peeping Fawn, and to group one winner, The Way You Are. Peeping Fawn has gone on to become the latest stakes producer from the family with grade one place stakes winner September out there. This is, of course, the family of Blush with Pride, winner of the Kentucky Oaks, and of Better Than Honor, both of those Blue Hen outstanding producers. Better Than Honor, of course, you know her as the dam of a couple of Belmont Stakes winners. So that's a look at two first-time starters on Saturday's Saratoga opener. Action from coast to coast this weekend. Keep watching Out of the Gate for more analysis on that. And don't forget to check out DRF TV for more analysis, including in-depth stakes previews, spa babies, and more. Peter Thomas Fornital back with you on Out of the Gate for a little bit of tournament talk. Hanging around at Saratoga this year, I've heard this expression, and I had to write an article about it today. I've been hearing it so much around the track. I'm a great handicapper, but a terrible better. Now, in this piece, I don't want to give away the store. You'll read about one example in particular of one of our paddock bar crew for whom that observation is indubitably true, talking about the ice cream man. You can read all about that. But I just wanted to reiterate on this week's Out of the Gate segment that if you're a player who feels that way, tournaments, fixed bankroll tournaments in particular, are an area you're going to want to explore. What is a fixed bankroll tournament? Well, it's a tournament that takes betting strategy out of the equation. In a live bankroll tournament, you're going to have to at least deal with the win and exact a pool very often. There's also going to be trifectas and doubles involved. So you don't really get to avoid betting mistakes in a live bankroll tournament. Betting strategy is still paramount there. However, online especially, when you're just picking one horse to bet, $2 to win and place on in every race, there's no betting strategy to goof you up. Similarly, in a contest like Saratoga's Low Roller, it costs $40 to play. They have them every Sunday and Monday. And you have to bet, I think, five horses. I forget exactly how it works out, but you have to make win place bets in five different races across the card. More complicated than online in that race selection becomes an issue. You have to choose which races you're going to play. But once again, every bet's a win place bet. You don't have to vary the amount. Betting goes out of the equation. If you're somebody who believes you're a great handicapper, not a great better, get involved in contests, whether we're talking about online, tournaments.drf.com, or in an event like the Saratoga Low Roller. You won't regret it. I also wanted to talk about what we have going on this weekend on DRF tournaments. On Saturday, we have a special qualifier for the Saratoga contest coming up on August 10th and 11th. $410 to play, and the winner gets a seat to both days, the Friday $1,000 Live Bank event, Saturday $2,000 Live Bank event, as well as $500 in travel. And actually, the bigger day this week, Sunday on DRF tournaments, not only do we have a Keeneland Challenge qualifier, once again, $410 to play in that one with $3,500 prize packages on the line, including that $3,000 Keeneland entry and some travel money. But also, new one coming up, lower price point, the Monmouth Super Qualifier, which I believe is happening on Travers Day, sometime later this month. You need to uh, buy in for 500 bucks. There's also 500 in travel. If you want to win it instead, you can play this Sunday, DRF tournaments, $120 to play, one in 10 will win those $1,000 packages to Monmouth. Lots of seats going to be on the line. I'll be writing more about that Monmouth contest. It was just added to the DRFT inventory. Great options this weekend. Go to tournaments.drf.com to check it all out. And that's all I have for this week. Just uh, some words of advice, encouragement to get involved in the tournament scene. If you have any questions, hit me up on Twitter, 
at Looms Boldly. Lots more content to come this Saratoga. I'm Peter Thomas Fornital. Stay tuned for more on Out of the Gate. Horse player looking to raise your game? For over 120 years, expert handicappers have relied on Daily Racing Form as their must have source for news and data, featuring exclusive buyer speed figures, Time Form US pace figures, and integrated replays. DRF Formulator is the most powerful handicapping tool on the market today. Use what the pros use. Go to drf.com slash formulator and enter code DRFTV to get your first card free. DRF.com, raise your game. Welcome back to Out of the Gate. Let's take a look at the field for the Grade 1 Alfred G. Vanderbilt Handicap. $350,000 is the purse. Ricard is race number 8 at Saratoga. Six furlongs on the dirt. You can get expanded stakes analysis of many of the major graded stakes races. Saturday, Sunday, coast to coast. Video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Form YouTube channel. Matt Switzerland. Boy, he loves a wet track. Three for four lifetime on the wet. He proved it last time out in the grade three Maryland sprint, his stakes debut. Who is this Switzerland? And what has he done to the Switzerland that we had come to know and loathe? You know, the weird thing is even when Chad had him and he didn't love to win races, he at least showed that he had a little bit of ability. He could just never put it all together. Now that he's with Steve Asmussen, he's just turned into a bit of a world beater. We're going to take a look back right now at his most recent start. This was the grade three Maryland sprint. And you're right, it was over a sloppy track. He clearly loved some moisture in the ground, but I thought this was a pretty authoritative victory, and this is really this is three consecutive wins by open lengths. And if this horse is the speed nearest the rail, Aspison doesn't seem too thrilled with that situation. But I think you've got one way to go. He's got that good early foot. I think you send him and hope that you can hold off the the more logical horses like Imperial Hint. His three best buyer speed figures have come on wet tracks. There is a possibility for wet weather at Saratoga on Saturday. Mike, you've always been a fan of Warriors Club. I mean, he's just a hardy horse. He's an overachiever. Yeah, he really is. He's a real hard trying little horse. You got to like that about him. Um, we'll see if he can really class up in a, in a grade one race. I think that's a little ambitious for a horse like him. But what he has going for him is um, that this this grade one Valderbilt did not come up all that strong as far as grade one competition goes. So maybe he actually fits really well in here. We're going to go back and look at a graded stakes win from this horse um, at Keeneland earlier this year in the Commonwealth. And this is, you know, typical of what you're going to get from Warriors Club. He got a good position in behind the lead. He was able to hold that position the entire way around the track. And once he comes clear in the stretch, there's just no denying this horse. He will not stop trying to run you down. You're going to see him forged to the front right at the end here. And he is going to prevail for a very game win in this race. He came back out of this race. Um, ran over a sloppy track at Churchill and ran really well again. Um, his typical race, I think, is going to give him a chance in this race because it's not that strong a field. Those are two talented horses, but Matt, the one to beat is the number four Imperial Hint when he is on his game. He's one of the better sprinters in the country. He draws outside his main speed and his main competition in Switzerland, and he could just work out a good pace pressing trip. It's kind of the way that I drew this thing up. I think he's going to get a trip very similar to the one that he had most recently in the true north. I understand maybe he's not going to be that far back, but I think he parks just off of the horse down on the inside, the speed horse. You see right now he's in those orange sleeves on the outside, rolling up about three, four path off the far turn. And really, this was kind of a new dimension that he had showed in this spot. Normally, he's a horse that's much more forward. This day, he showed that he can sit a little bit off of it and still come with that big run. I think Imperial is strictly the horse to beat in here, and I think it's about time. He, he he deserves a grade one for as well as he's run. It's time for him to finally get a grade one next to his name. Mike, he came out of that race with a little bit of a foot problem, and that's been an issue with Imperial Hint throughout his career. He's been a little bit ouchy, but it looks like he just found the right field to notch his first grade one win. 
Yeah, that's exactly how I looked at it. I mean, I agree with everything Matt said about him anyway. Um, it just feels like they found a really good spot here for him to pick up a grade one win. Um, you know, I'm a little concerned that, you know, it feels like maybe he's not quite as good this year so far as he was last year. Um, but this is the right field for him. And this is this is just a spot I feel like he's supposed to win. I agree. I think Imperial Hint's going to trip out under Javier, sit second off of Switzerland, make his bid on the turn, and just get the better of these. He's my top selection as well in the grade one Alfred G. Vanderbilt handicap, albeit at a pretty short price. We'll stay in the sprint division, but we'll move out west to Del Mar. The Bing Crosby is up next. It's a Breeders' Cup win and you're in. Let's throw up the field for the Breeders' Cup Challenge Series race on Saturday. It's a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Sprint. It's the Grade 1 Bing Crosby Stakes, going six furlongs for $300,000. Carded as race number nine at Del Mar. You can get expanded stakes previews of many of the graded stakes races all weekend long, coast to coast, at video.drf.com or the Daily Racing Forum YouTube channel. This race, Mike, a win and you're in for the Breeders' Cup Sprint, and it features last year's Breeders' Cup Sprint winner, the very talented Roy H. Yeah, it does. Roy H. Uh, obviously put together quite a campaign last year for for Peter Miller, um, which he capped off with that big Breeders' Cup Sprint win. I think he's come back uh, really well this year too, guys. I mean, you know, it's 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 just really getting started for him. But they made their early season goal the big race uh, for $2 million in, in Dubai. And I actually felt like he ran okay in that race. We're gonna put the replay up and you're gonna see that he's never gonna really find a way to make him uh, his way to the lead in this race. Um, but I like the way that he raced on. And of course this was Dubai World Cup night. It felt like the rail was really the place to be. This horse never got anywhere near the inside in this race. Um, I actually feel like he ran okay in here against a good field of horses. He's back in the States. He's all set, I think, to have a big second half of the year. I know he's the favorite in this race, but I, I didn't really want to bet against him. He was in against two toughies in Mind Your Biscuits and XY Jet in that race. A little class drop even in this grade one field, and it is a pretty salty grade one. Matt, your top selection in this race won the Bing Crosby last year, got a little lucky. Yeah, he got a little bit of an assist last year. Ransom the Moon did because we saw Dre falling. He dumped Mike Smith, floated Roy H about 15 paths wide, and that was the difference because Ransom the Moon was able to shoot up the wood. Kind of this, the reverse happened to Ransom the Moon. Two starts back in the Kona Gold. We're going to go back and look at that run right now. Situation where another Peter Miller horse actually floated Ransom the Moon quite wide off the far turn, allowed Bobby Abu Dhabi to shoot up the inside, and really that was the difference maker. I kind of like what this horse has done so far here in 2018. I know he's only raced twice, but he ran well that day. Then they came back in the Met Mile, a distance that's just too far for him and against better horses in all likelihood. And he didn't run terrible there to run fifth. I think this is what he wants to do. And again, Del Mar, not a problem for him. I'll take a chance with the number eight, St. Joe Bay. This is a back classer who did really well off the John Sadler claim most recently. Let's go back to that grade two San Carlo Stakes where he was in against odds on favorite American Anthem and they threw it down from the start. St. Joe Bay on the rail, American Anthem on the outside. And despite being dismissed as a 42 to one chance on the San Carlos, St. Joe Bay gave American Anthem all he could handle. American Anthem is once again going to be a much shorter price than St. Joe Bay. I think St. Joe Bay could get the jump on American Anthem. He draws outside of that foe. I think he could be sitting off of American Anthem. If American Anthem's a little sluggish coming out of the gate, Bob Baffert thinks seven is better than this six for American Anthem. Maybe St. Joe Bay, if he can continue to call upon his back class, can surprise at a little bit of a price in the Bing Crosby. He does have those back races and he's run well at Del Mar in the past. JK's play of the day, he's going to Saratoga for a multiple race wager. David Aragona from Timeform US previews the Amsterdam Stakes for his Time Form U.S. Spotlight. Let's go to those segments. Hey everybody, welcome to JK's Play of the Day. Uh, in between flights on my way to Del Mar, childhood home here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, tempted to run over to Lone Star Park, but I don't think my layover is gonna, gonna be long enough for that. Uh, Saratoga pick three this Saturday, starting in race seven. Um, I'm gonna start here with uh, three horses uh, coming out of the same race. I'm gonna use Promises Fulfilled, uh, who was cutting back last time. I didn't really like the cutback. It was kind of a big cutback from a mile and a quarter to seven furlongs. I didn't think that he was going to be sharp enough. He ran huge in that race. Uh, the pace was, was quick there. If you take a look at time form US, uh, that early pace figure was coming back like a 175. It's extremely fast. He was forwardly placed there, cutting back even a little bit more. I feel like the jump from seven to six and a half is going to fit him a little bit better than the mile and a quarter 
to seven furlongs. Engage has been working well by all accounts, ran well. And the Woody Stevens as well, running second in there. It's Chad Brown at Saratoga. It's Jose Ortiz at Saratoga. He's eight to five. He's the type of horse you have to include if you're going to be playing multi-race bets. And the World of Trouble was actually my pick in the Woody Stevens. Uh, Jason Service, obviously, uh, in the limelight a little bit more now than he was going into the last race. The horse probably will take a lot of money because of that. But he was right there sitting off of Promises Fulfilled, and I think that he'll run well in that spot as well. So I'll use the two, the three, and the six uh, in the Amsterdam leading up to the uh, H. Allen Jerkins, one of my favorite races at Saratoga, formerly known as the King's Bishop. The grade one Vanderbilt, race eight. I'm going to use one horse here, and that horse is going to be Imperial Hint. I think Imperial Hint is extremely talented. I think his best distance is going to be at six. He ran well at seven before. He's run well at six and a half. Now he's cutting back even further to six. There is some speed in here, but he's the speed of the speed, and the speed of the speed, in my opinion, going six furlongs is always dangerous. I'm going to single Imperial Hint in this spot. He's drawn outside of the horse that I think is probably the most likely horse to challenge him, and that's Switzerland. Uh, I think Imperial Hint will be extremely tough. I'm going to single him in race eight. He's the four horse. Then on to the Bowling Green, the mile and and three-eighths. It's a tricky distance. Uh, You never know what you're going to get from some of these marathon turf races. A lot of times it's the trip that gets the job done. I'm going to use the two-channel maker. Uh, for Bill Mott, that horse has run well. He ran well in the Manhattan, just got beat. A, he was eighth place, but he got beat a length. It was kind of a, uh, a wild finish in that race uh, where spring quality got up. I'm going to use bigger picture. I joke about it on the podcast all the time. Uh, Mike Maker can throw PTF and I in a horse suit and get us to run a mile and, and a half or a mile and a quarter on the turf. I'm going to use bigger picture in there. He always seems to show up. Trust the old Saddler's Joy. I think he ran the best race in the Manhattan, and I think he's probably the most likely winner of this race. But considering the fact that he always takes so far back, he's a horse that's hard to lean on. He could run into pace issues, traffic issues. So Sadler's Joy is one that I'm going to use as the most, I'm going to say is the most likely winner, but I'm going to use uh, with some other horses in here as well. I'm continuously against High Happy. I'm going to stay against him here, and I'm going to use Manitoulin on the outside for Jimmy Toner. I think that horse has run some good races as well and could be dangerous in a forward position drawn on the outside. Good luck. We'll see you next week. Hi, everyone. This is David Aragona with this week's Time Formula Spotlight. It's a great card on Saturday at Saratoga. Plenty plenty of interesting complex races, four graded stakes races and races seven through ten. We're going to take a look at the first of those. It's the grade three Amsterdam featuring three-year-old sprinters going six and a half furlongs. Uh, We've got the second, third, and fourth place finishers out of the Woody Stevens from Belmont Stakes Day. Uh, The horse that's probably going to go favored in this race is the number three engaged. Uh, But we'll take a look at the entire field uh, as we see the Time Form U.S. preview screen. One of the things to notice about this race is some pretty hefty high early pace ratings to the left of the running styles of each horse, uh, ranging from 124 down to 110 for the horses that are going to be up contesting that pace. And while the Time Form U.S. pace projector is not predicting a fast pace in this race, you can see that there are three horses across the track out front. And uh, I think that these three are going to hook up much the way that they did early in the Woody Stevens. Uh, The number two horse promises fulfilled, uh, the number six world of trouble, the number five horse is sitting right behind them is strike power. And then also thrown into the mix is old time revival. Number four, he too is a need the lead type. So it seems like there's going to be some hitting up front in this race. We'll take a look at that likely favorite though, the number three engage. Uh, He just seems like the horse that's probably going to get the right trip once again. I mean, he got A good pace to run into in the Woody Stevens. He couldn't quite get there. Is still having fun. The winner of that race came from even farther back in the pack and ran past him late. But Engage is just an ultra-consistent horse. He's never been out of the exacta in six career starts. He doesn't have as high speed figures as some others in this field. I haven't been blown away by any of his races. He's just always there at the end. And I think he's a reliable horse that you have to use in this race. But at a pretty short price, I think there's better value to be found elsewhere. Uh, let's take a look at one of the other one of the speeds out of the Woody Stevens, the number uh, two horse promises fulfilled. Uh, in some ways, he ran the best race last time because he was setting that fast pace. You see the time form U.S. pace rating line for that race. He ran a 175 pace rating for the first quarter, followed by a 150, 128. Uh, to get an 18 point jump from his raw speed figure of 109 up to that final time form U.S. speed figure of 127 is pretty astronomical. You don't see jumps like that. And that just illustrates how fast that pace was in the Woody Stevens. Uh, he did well to fend off World of Trouble at the head of the stretch. Uh, he really held that horse off all the way to the finish. I thought Promises Filled was just extremely game in that Woody Stevens, even though we finished third in that race. 
The problem with him here, though, is he's once again drawn inside of World of Trouble and the other speeds. He's going to be under the gun from the gate. And it's just hard to envision a path to victory for this horse, given all the pace pressure that he's likely to receive. Uh, the horse that's going to be pressing him is World of Trouble. Now, World of Trouble does draw a good post position in this race because he, he is outside of the other speed horses. So if Arado Ortiz can get him to relax a little bit, maybe he can stalk just off those horses. Although he is a horse that has run his best races when he's out front. Um, we saw him, you know, really explode in the stretch of that uh, Pasco Stakes at Tampa Bay Downs at the begin beginning of the winter. Didn't quite handle the stretch out in the Tampa Bay Derby, but, you know, he ran just as well as promises fulfilled in the Woody Stevens stalking that horse and really taking a run at him around the far turn into the stretch and just couldn't get by him late, but they basically finished on even terms that day. I think you also have to take note that Jason Service, the trainer of World of Trouble, has been on quite a run over the past few months at Belmont and Monmouth, winning at nearly 50 percent consistently for about two months now. Uh, World of Trouble is very dangerous, but I don't think you're going to get great value on him. He's probably going to be an even shorter price than Promises Fulfilled, given the live barn. So I think he's a contender, along with Engaged and Promises Fulfilled. Ultimately, I'm taking a shot against all three of these horses with a long shot in this race. I'm just looking for the horse that's going to be able to sit the right trip in behind the speeds. And I think that might be the number one horse, Barry Lee, who's going to be a price in this race. Now, I, he's faced optional claim in company, company in his two starts as a three-year-old, and he lost both of those races by substantial margins. But when you really dissect his trips in those races, he hasn't run quite as badly as it seems. In his seasonal debut on May 28th, uh, he rated off a slow pace. You see the blue color-coded pace figures for all of the pace ratings in that race. And he just was a little too far off that pace. And the winner, West Fest, was a pretty nice older horse, went wire to wire. Next time out, even though it's not noted in the running line, he actually broke pretty slowly from the inside and had to rush up to contest that pace. Um, unlike in his first start of the year, this was actually a fast pace. So he really, um, you know, it was hard for him to, uh, it was a taxing trip to have to rush up into that pace and then uh, duel with some nice older horses. The winner of that race, Majestic Affair, has been competitive in some stakes races, just probably tougher horses than he's facing in this spot. Uh, going back to his two-year-old season, Barry Lee was able to rate behind horses and make a run. I like the rider switch to Jarrell Rosario. He's the kind of guy that can get these horses to relax off others and make that late push. So I'm hoping that Barry Lee works out the right trip and is ready to take a step forward. He's going to be a price. Um, you know, it's a bit of a reach, but I think this is a race that could come apart a bit at the end. So I'm taking a shot with Barry Lee in the Amsterdam. Now let's send it back to Dan in the studio. Time for our best bet segment here on Out of the Gate. Matt, your best bets have been firing hard lately, and you've got something at Del Mar in the co-feature. Yeah, Calbred Stakes race out there on the grass, a mile and the 16th, the Cal Dream. And I like the number seven horse, Fly to Mars. This is a horse going out for Peter Miller. The most recent start, normally this horse has been campaigned about six and a half furlongs down the hill, but the most recent run was two turns, and the blinkers came off. And I think that was really the key, because this horse usually is much more forwardly placed, Blinkers come off. He relaxed nice and kind. And finally, once he got into the stretch run, he absolutely kicked home in a big, big way for Flavian Pratt. I think this is a scenario where he fits in here well. Ann Arboretti, the runner-up, he came back and earned a 91 in his next start. I think this horse fits in here pretty well. Looks like there's a lot of pace signed on. He's 5-1 to one on the morning line. I don't know if they get 5, but maybe he goes off in that 7-2 to two range. I like Fly to Mars. Mike Beer, Naira analyst, you're going to the spa. Yeah, the, uh, the finale on Saturday's card race 11 is a loaded allowance race for three-year-old fillies on the grass. It's at a mile and an eighth. It's got a full gate of horses. Um, I like Sippin' Kitten in this race for top connections. Mike Maker, the Ramses. This horse broke her maiden two starts back at Keeneland. We're going to look at the replay of that race. This race is at a mile and three sixteenths. So the mile and an eighth is going to have is going to be no problem for her on Saturday. Here she is. You know, she saved a lot of ground in this race. She came clear in the upper stretch. And right about here inside the eighth pole, she's going to fire a good one right through between the leaders in here. She's going to go clear at the end. This horse wants every bit of the nine furlongs. And I think that's a little bit of a question for some of these other horses. She came out of this race to run a real good second in a stakes race in her last start. I think this is a good spot for this horse. I'm going to go for some stakes action at Laurel. Race number five is the Twixt Stakes. And I like the number 10, Lake Ponchar Train. This horse is a true professional. She has won 13 of 36 lifetime starts and she had won three consecutive dirt races going into her most recent race the dashing beauty stakes at delaware going six furlongs let's take a look at that race right 
now. And as they turn into the stretch, this horse is in behind horses, and the winning move is going to be made by Jessica Krupnik on the far outside. And Lake Ponchart Train just really can't get through, and it's too late. Jessica Krupnik's now in full flight. Lake Ponchart Train still has some run, though. She's going to split horses. She's going to make this real close down to the wire, and she's only going to drop a nose decision. She doesn't have to be that far off of the pace. She's a real hard hitter. She's 5-1 to one on the morning line. I think some of the shorter-priced horses in the Twixt at Laurel, they're a little bit vulnerable. I just don't trust them at shortish prices. Lake Pont Chart Train will be running late. 5-1 to one on the morning line on the number 10 in race number 5 at Laurel on Saturday. We thank you so much for watching this week's edition of Out of the Gate, and we urge you to follow all of DRF TV's video offerings on Twitter, at DRF Video, and for the latest news and notes from America's Turf Authority Daily Racing Forum, follow on Twitter at DRF Inside Post. That's it for this week. Best of luck when your horses break. Out of the Gate.